Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. We're very grateful for your support and, and very pleased you could be with us. I'm David Dodick. I'm the chair of the American Brain Foundation and a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. The American Brain Foundation is very proud to be stepping into the role as the national standard bearer for brain disease research. Our vision, as you know, is a life without brain disease. And our strategy is to support research that will uncover the common biological mechanisms that give rise to several different diseases. And by doing this, we believe we can, when we cure one, we will cure many. Our partner, of course, is the American Academy of Neurology. And this important partnership puts us in a very unique position to identify and support only the research <clears throat> that will be most impactful and lead to advances in treatments and cures. This is because the American Academy of Neurology is the world's largest association of neurologists and neuroscientists, and therefore it houses the nation's and indeed the world's brain trust in all of these neurological diseases. So who better to decide where, on whom, and, and when that, that money is spent? Now our focus tonight will be Lewy body dementia. And we're very fortunate to have two very special guests with us tonight. First guest is Susan Schneider-Williams. Susan's a, an artist and an advocate. She's been a graphic designer for more than 25 years. And for the last 15 of these years, she's founded and ran her own company, Critical Eye Design, which has transitioned into Susan Schneider Fine Art. In addition to creating, <clears throat> she mentors art students and curates shows for fellow artists and she's exhibited in numerous shows, group and solo, and her paintings are in private collections throughout the United States. But entering the world of advocacy was really not part of Susan's plan. In 2014, when her husband Robin Williams died from Lewy body disease, she set out to raise awareness about this devastating yet little known brain disease. And since the discovery of her husband's diagnosis at autopsy, she has become a very prominent voice for Lewy body dementia and brain disease research. She joined the board of the American Brain Foundation and is now the vice chair of the American Brain Foundation. And I'm very happy and proud and honored to have her um, as, my, as my wing woman. Susan has authored the editorial, The Terrorist Inside My Husband's Brain for the American Academy of Neurology's journal. Uh, to date, it is the number one most read article of all time in neurology. I've spent 30 years trying to write a paper that's the number one most read article, and Susan did it uh, in no time flat. She was presented with the American Brain Foundation's Commitment to Cures Award in 2016 in recognition for her advocacy, and she's spoken at many academic institutions and private research corporations. She's lobbied in Washington, D.C., with the American Academy of Neurology um, and with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and lobbied others for better diagnostics, for increased funding and support for researchers, doctors, and clinicians. And she's helped importantly set up a Lewy Body Dementia Fund that supports among other things, research in a quest to find a biomarker for Lewy body disease. And I'm sure you're gonna hear more about that this evening. Our other special guest tonight is Dr. Melissa Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is the director of the Mangurian Clinical Research Headquarters for Lewy Body Dementia at the University of Florida in Gainesville, which is one of 25 centers in the United States recognized as a Lewy Body Dementia Association Research Center of Excellence. She also serves on the Lewy Body Dementia Association Scientific Advisory Council. Her research focuses primarily on the lived experience of disease for individuals with Lewy body dementia and their families, ranging from patient and caregiver priorities for care to hospital outcomes to end of life experiences. So I wanna welcome both Susan um, and Dr. Armstrong this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David. <laughs> so, let, let us get started. I'm going to pose a few questions to Susan and Melissa and, and, and have them answer so we can all be brought up to speed. You know, recently um, a documentary 
full feature documentary, which is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, that was developed in large part under the leadership of Susan, uh, premiered, and you can watch it now on streaming services. Uh, and we had a fantastic session where <clears throat> we had Susan and others talk about the, the making of that film. But tonight I, I want to ask um, Susan and Dr. Armstrong how Robin's Lewy body dementia journey uh, really informs our conversation and should inspire us. And maybe I'll, talk, I'll ask you, Susan, from a, from a patient and a caregiver perspective, how has Robin's journey helped to inform and inspire both you as well as other patients and caregivers and indeed um, clinicians like me? Thank you, David. Uh, and I just want to say briefly, thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, so Robin's, I would say, you know, Robin's experience with Lewy body dementia in a way is, is kind of what you, many aspects of it is what you don't want to have happen. And it's more of a testament to the complexity of this disease than to, oh, not enough's being done. And I say that, I mean, we are, we are all wanting to do more and we will be doing much more. We are, and, and a lot does need to be done much. But the point is, is that his, his journey with it illuminates how difficult it is to get a diagnosis, to understand what's going on. And, and so I think, you know, Robin was, Robin got to have the full, the full tilt on this disease. He had, it's important to know that he had one of the worst cases that they've ever seen. So, you know, when someone comes to me and they're concerned about a loved one, it's, it's really important to note that, A, if someone has Parkinson's, it's not always gonna lead to Lewy body. And if they have Lewy body, it's not always gonna be like what, Rob, what, what, what Robin went through. His was very extreme. So I think because of that, because of that, we've been given a really big gift to better understand through his experience, through our experience with this disease, the character of, of what it's like. You know, we didn't have the, the perfect experience and everything worked out great. I mean, it was at all twists and turns, every challenge that most people um, who are aware of Lewy body disease, who know about it, they've experienced at least one or several points of what we went through. So, so I think it's, it's, it is incredibly informative and that's why I felt it was so important for this story to be told and shared. And so, you know, the hope is that people will be inspired to, you know, you have to know what the problem is first before you can come up with a solution. And this is such a complex, difficult to see, difficult to diagnose, difficult to deal with problem that we need all the information we can get. We need people sharing about it and, and opening up about it. So hopefully this is rolling away some of the shame for people who are, you know, giving some hope, helping them realize they are not alone. You know, we were not, we're not the only ones who have gone through this. And we're not, we're not even the only ones who've gone through this where, where, Sadly, the very end ended in suicide. This is, it's not an uncommon thing. So um, hopefully this will give people the understanding that there's a community out there, they're not alone, and there's a lot of resources and that people are working really hard around the planet to get to the bottom of this. And Melissa is one of those people and I couldn't be more proud to be on here with her. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, hey, Susan. Um, maybe just Susan, can you tell us, in retrospect, looking back, when was the first sign that, what was the first symptom or the first sign that Robin had um, that maybe was just passed off and just thought to be, maybe he was just having, going through a bad spell? How far back does this go, do you think? So that was, um, that was about, let, a little less than a year um, before Robin left. And he was experiencing gut discomfort. And so this, this was the beginning of, 
us searching down all sorts of different rabbit holes, trying to understand what these symptoms were, because they all seemed like they weren't connected. He, um, you know, looking back, he did have a loss of, of sense of smell, which was one aspect. The gut discomfort, we tested for diverticulitis. It turned out to be nothing. There was, there was nothing. And the way, part of the character of LBD is that by the time you start searching down one symptom, that one might disappear for a while, like whack-a-mole, it goes under, and you think it's gone, you think, oh, well, that was, okay, that's what it was, it's over, and then something else pops up. And Robin was having, you know, you know I would say the really the big thing that came from that diverticulite, diverticulitis um, scare, in a way, was the scare. So on that, Robin experienced this extreme onset, it was a sudden and prolonged onset of anxiety. And what I learned later is that is a, that is a hallmark of um, Lewy body. And it's not, you know, typically, you know, your spouse, you know, you know, the people in your life, if you, if someone that you love is suffering from this, you, you already, you know, their normal baseline moods, fears, and anxieties. We all have them. And, and there's ranges to them, depending on what's going on in our life. If we're, if we're, we happen to not be getting enough sleep, we're working too hard, like, um, you know, things can be stressful. And especially if you're in the media, like Robin was, you know, or any job, any of us on here tonight, you know, we all have stressors. But this was something that was beyond. And it was this beginning of seeing that the response he was having was not matching up to the facts that were at hand. And that, that was very out of character for Robin. Very out of character. Yeah. Dr. Armstrong is a neurologist and researcher and an expert on this particular disease. Um, what has Robin's journey, how should Robin's journey inform and inspire clinicians and researchers like, um, like the rest of us? Yeah, well, I, I want to emphasize just how much this movie and, and Susan sharing this story means to people living with the disease because, as she mentioned, it's really different for different people, but there are so many people who have heard about Robin's story or seen it in the movie and they're like, yes, that, that is part of what we experienced. You know, we had all these weird symptoms and we didn't know how to put them together and it took, you know, years to put the pieces together. You know, we saw different people, we couldn't get an answer, we went down these rabbit trails. And so I think it's been a really powerful thing for Susan to share because people really do resonate with their experience and they don't feel as alone when they know that they aren't the only ones. And then I also think that the movie and the media surrounding it is bringing attention to Louis body. And that is a really important thing for people living with the disease, for families and for physicians and researchers. I've had people email me um, relating to some of the, you know, activities surrounding the movie saying, wow, my wife has these symptoms. Like, I, I, I didn't know this was a thing. Can I come see you? And so I think that the movie and the different things surrounding it are bringing attention to this disease. And a lot of people haven't heard about it. And that is a really important thing. From the physician and the research side, I think one of the big things that his experience highlights is how far we have to go with making this diagnosis. So right now it is estimated that one in three people with this disease never get the diagnosis at all. And of the two out of the three who do get the diagnosis, many of them receive an incorrect diagnosis first, or the process to get that diagnosis takes many doctors over many years. And so I think one of the big takeaways is we need to find ways to better recognize it. We need to find better tests so that we can look for it. And we need to help people get to a diagnosis faster. Because even though right now, we don't have a cure to stop it and we can't slow it down. There really is a lot of power in being able to name it and know what's going on. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I, I know we've spoken about this before, Susan, but um, and I, I'm sure I asked you this before, but what would having had a name, I mean, you and Robin struggled for quite some time searching uh, and going down rabbit holes, knowing that there isn't a cure or a treatment for this disease, why would having had a name for this disease, what would that have meant to you and Robin? That's, it's, I didn't feel this way before because when I initially, in fact, when I wrote the editorial in 2016, my, my sense was, well, if there isn't a cure, then what's, what does it matter if you actually don't, you know, don't have a name, don't have it, um, it diagnosed, if there's no cure? Uh, in, in other words, if, if we could diagnose this, what would that do? And boy, I, my, my thinking on that has just completely turned on, on its head, on my head, <laughs> 180. And that's because when you are looking at you, you don't have your, you have no power. You're so busy chasing, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. And, you know, as Melissa described, I mean, it, there's just this, this endless seeking and that endless testing. And so if we had, if we'd had a name, we would have known what to ask. And even if let's say our doctor didn't know about it, at least we could ask about it. And then if, if, if we needed, if we weren't satisfied, we could go to another care provider um, to get, to find out, well, who does know the most information right now about this? You know, who would be able to help? What are, what is available? You know, we would have found out that there's an entire community, that there is, there's resources out there to help. We would have been in a position of power and so that Robin could have decided if he wanted to be part of a clinical trial, which, mm -hmm. You know, for many people, when you don't have, you don't, you know, what power do you have against the disease? There are, you know, we'll be finding out in the coming years what you can do, what can be done. And I'm sure Melissa is aware of some things right now. Um, but it would at least put you in a position where you could, you could take control now and, and um, make choices. And even if it was as simple as, you know, it's, it's, let's say in Robin's case, let's say it was really bad news. If we had it, if we had scans that were proper scans or diagnostics that indicated exactly how ravaged his brain actually was, you know, Robin could decide what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. He yeah. could say, you know what, I, I don't want to work anymore. I want to just be with my family. I want to be on the beach. You know, let's, let's make sure our affairs are in order. And, you know, to get the truth about a situation is more valuable, it, it, negate, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, what the prognosis is, it's getting the truth of it. And as a human being on this planet, you only have so, you know, with whatever time you have left, the key point is it's your time. So um, I just, I, that's, I'm all in on trying to fi find a biomarker now. And in fact, um, I don't know if I should start talking about this now, but I guess I'm gonna. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So, at the at the American Brain Foundation, we we created a Lewy Body Dementia Fund, and um, part of that, the um, the initial five million dollars is going to go into a um, it's going towards a grant research program that is targeted at finding a biomarker. So, what's so exciting about this is, a we've got well over half the money so far. And B, the people who designed it, we pulled together the best researchers in the world to come up with what's the, what is the most important thing we need to do right now. Actually, wait, I take it back. We consulted with patients, um, loved, one, excuse me, loved ones who'd already lost um, their father or husbands at relatives to Lewy body. And we said, what do you think is the most important thing that needs to be discovered the quickest in this, in this disease. And everybody, they felt the same way I did. It was, to, we need to find, we need diagnosis. We need to get better biomarkers, some biomarker that's clear cut. So they were all in and they were some of our initial um, uh, donors, which was amazing. And, and so what we did is we, we pulled together this team from around the world, um, and they designed 
what needs to be done. And so we're looking forward to finishing off the fundraising for that first part. It's like our first bucket within the Louis Body Dementia Fund. This, this first bucket is gonna go straight towards science to find a biomarker. Um, so that's, that's something I've been working really hard on for, for, um, for a long time now. And, um, and yeah. And so Dr. Armstrong, how close do you think we are uh, to a biomarker? So I think there are some candidates, some things we're hoping for. Um, so in the criteria we have for the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies now, it lays out a few biomarkers that can help. But the problem with the biomarkers that we have right now is that they're not very specific to Lewy body dementia. So some of those biomarkers are more to exclude that Alzheimer disease is part of the problem, though people can have both. It's not uncommon to have both Lewy body and Alzheimer changes in the brain. And then there's a, call, a scan called a DAT scan that can be used to support that someone has something in the Parkinson family, but isn't specific to Lewy body dementia, and it has some, its own, some of its own strengths and limitations. There are a number of projects in the works that are trying to find biomarkers. So, People are looking at MRI. Can we use some alternate MRI techniques to identify Lewy body dementia? There are some studies looking at EEG, the test we use for seizures. Could we use specialized EEG to identify Lewy body dementia? Uh, there are some research studies looking at blood tests for synuclein, that's the protein we think is involved in the Lewy body diseases. Could we detect that in blood? Could we detect that in spinal fluid? And then there's been a long need to be able to find that protein in the brain on special scans. And that has not worked so far, but there's a lot of interest in that. But I would say, well, there are a bunch of different pathways that people are following for the biomarker. There's a real need for more research to figure out which one of these or maybe which ones of these will need to really make a good diagnosis. Yeah, it, it's critically important because, you know, when we, when we see patients every day, like I did today, before you implement a treatment regimen, you have to know what you're dealing with. And so the first thing you do is embark upon a diagnostic evaluation. You run tests to see what it is that you're dealing with before you can actually start treatment. Um, so it's critical. I think that's one thing. The other thing is that if we have a biomarker or if we have a test that we can do that confirms with a high degree of accuracy this diagnosis, it's quite likely that that means we're that much further along. We have a target now, perhaps, and we're that much further along to developing a treatment and potentially, indeed, even a cure. Would you both agree with that? I think so, um, with the idea that if we can identify that protein that's building up, we think we know what it is, but recently there's been some debate, but let's assume synuclein is the cause. If we can identify that, and then we can find a drug that might get rid of those clumps, a biomarker would be really helpful for that. And they're doing some of that now in the Alzheimer's disease studies. They have an amyloid scan that looks for the buildup of amyloid in the brain, and now they are trying drugs that hopefully would get rid of some of that amyloid, and then they're doing the scans before and after to see if the medication is successful. And one of the really powerful things about that, having a, a, a scan or a test that you can do pre-post, is it lets us know much more quickly if a medication is helping. These are generally slow-ish diseases. I would say dementia with Lewy bodies is faster than many, but still in the course of a clinical trial, many of our drug trials are over you know, 12 weeks. But if you wanna know if you're changing the course of a disease, those studies can be one year, two years, three years, but that's a long time to get an answer and very expensive. So if we could find a scan that we do the scan now, we give the new drug and we do the scan again and we can see if it makes a difference, that would be a very powerful tool. Yeah, 
I'd have to say just being a, a, a visual artist that I want to see, I want to see where it is. And, and, and especially with what I've just learned about the brain, uh, what it, it's so important where it is, where the problem is, um, particularly when it gets into behavior type um, side effects, you know, that from the disease or symptoms from the disease that could be interpreted one way, but it, it's, let's say for, for example, depression or anxiety in itself. It's, if you can pinpoint it to, oh, that's in the anxiety area of the brain, or um, for example, Robin's amygdala, which um, is the area having to do with your emotional response to things. And I, I don't know if it's actual fight or flight, Melissa, you could correct me, but amygdala definitely has to do with rising anxiety or your feelings around people, social situations, and how you can um, change the temperature gauge on your own response. So Robin's, Robin's gauge for his own anxiety was broken. And so imagine that you can't control your level of anxiety or paranoia and, and then combine there's delusions going on. So if, if there was a scan that would show very clearly, wow, the amygdala has, is just overridden right now. Now we know why. Like Robin, what that to me, when I discovered that, it was shown to me when I met with the, um, Brent, the uh, neuro, neuropathologist, he that that was like finding the smoking gun in our case because this was robin's greatest struggle was the anxiety paranoia and delusions and i don't you know and probably the hallucinations too which is the one thing he he did not share about so but because of the fact that the amygdala was so overtaken i you know i i i had been by my husband with all of the fear and what was going on and it's it wasn't matching with what was reality. And so now I know from everything I've learned, I can visualize what was going on in there, but to have this scan that would point it out would be amazing. And, that, and to the point about many people, you know, there's typically like a quote comorbidity going on. There's going to be these other cofactors like Alzheimer's, which is the tau tangles or other protein problems, amyloid plaque. Robin had both of those. They just weren't winning. You know, Louis body was way ahead, uh, but Alzheimer's was in there and as well as he had plaque buildup. So that would be something too, is to, you know, not just have this blanket scan, but something that really identifies. Ultimately, I would absolutely love for us to be able to announce, and I know this is, <laughs> this is why I'm not a scientist or a doctor, <laughs> but I, I, you have to be, you know, hopeful that wouldn't it be great to announce some sort of new scan that not only identifies the alpha synuclein problem and the tang but the tau tangles the plaque and kind of calls each out what it is and where it is i think we're getting closer and closer to that day actually you know we've got we can do pet scans now with tau tracers for example and see exactly where tau is deposited in the brain so we're getting very close to being able to sort of parse and separate these disorders out. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that um, the future is near. I should also say too, it'd be interesting to hear your take on this, Dr. Armstrong, but it's important obviously for the reasons we discussed to have a disease biomarker, but it's also important to have at-risk biomarkers. So before disease actually settles in, it would be nice to know who is at risk because there's ultimately where if we have a treatment for this, we can actually intervene before the person even develops symptoms. Would you agree? And could you sort of elaborate on that for our audience? Sure. So when we think about Lewy body diseases, so those diseases that if we, we look at the brain after someone has died, they have these Lewy body uh, findings on the exam. So those diseases include Parkinson disease, Parkinson's disease dementia, which is part of the Lewy body dementia umbrella, and then dementia with Lewy bodies, which is part of that Lewy body dementia umbrella. And those kind of early symptoms, they call them prodromal features, features that something is coming, they really overlap between those different Lewy body diseases. And we know what some of them are now. 
So there's something called REM sleep behavior disorder. That's when people act out their dreams, not just talking, but really, you know, slugging, hitting, bruising the bed partner, falling out of bed, really enacting the dreams. That can happen even 10, sometimes even 20 years before other signs of the Lewy body disease. People can lose smell for many reasons, so bad cold, head trauma, but loss of smell can be an early warning sign. If there are blood pressure fluctuations, that can be an early warning sign. And there are a couple of different attempts, currently just used for research, not used in routine clinical care, saying here are the different markers that we have that we know increases a person's risk. There's one uh, group that does that for Parkinson. Recently, just in the last couple of months, there have been prodromal criteria published for dementia with Lewy bodies. Those were published in Neurology, the journal of the AAN. And really those two things overlap because it's the same risk markers for both diseases because it's the same kind of problem in the brain. So we now have kind of a list of things that we say, look, especially if you have more than one of these things, your risk is higher. And eventually we'll have these biomarkers where we could say, okay, you have these things, now you have this biomarker, and hopefully now we can put you in this research trial that might help stop this before you even have symptoms. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I just wanna say that if any, any of our audience here has a question, please just uh, message us in the chat box and we'll be sure to get to that question. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so that allows me to ask yet another question. <laughs> um, Susan, you've obviously done a huge amount to raise awareness and the public's consciousness around this disease in the making and the distribution and release of this documentary. Um, but talk to us about what patients and caregivers can do to generate a groundswell of public support. I mean, in your wildest dreams, if you could do, if you had the resources to do anything right now and appeal to patients and caregivers, what would you have them do uh, to generate public support for research in Lewy body dementia? So I, I think based on kind of tagging on what Melissa was just talking about and the way this, I, I just want to say there's this ecosystem with the disease. Every aspect of it is important to look at. And, 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 and what I want to say from that is not just if you're a researcher or a doctor, but if you're a patient, a caregiver, it, someone in the community, a, a family member, there's, um, there are things about knowing what not to do and what to do. And, um, and so I think this increasing awareness and action in whatever, um, whatever your relationship is to the disease, whoever you are in the play, okay, that, that you're taking action. If your role is, uh, you're the patient, well, maybe, and maybe it's not clear yet what you have. Well, if you've heard about this thing called Lewy body, maybe you can ask about it. And, and say that to your caregiver and then they can go, well, gosh, next time we're in the doctor, let's ask about it. Um, maybe it can be as simple as let's, let's watch the film <laughs> because maybe that'll, that'll help us um, understand a little more. And um, maybe it's if you, by just knowing about this, knowing to ask the question from wherever you are in the ecosystem, it's gonna help us get to solutions to solve this. So, you know, while I am obviously, I'm really intent on our one research grant project, there are so many and there's so much great work going on out there and they're all very important. Um, you know, Robin was, Robin was given an antipsychotic and um, you can understand why at that moment, why that was what the doctor decided. However, if someone does have Lewy body, this is something you, don't want to do. Um, it can it can progress the disease and to a point rapidly, and then when the medication is removed, the disease does not go back. It it remains progressed. And um, Robin went through that, you know. Uh, so 
So that would have to do with, yes, if we have a way of diagnosis. If, and if we have not only a way of diagnosing, but for the general public, for even just the community, if they're not um, close to this disease yet, you know, they may be someday, or maybe they're close to another one of the dementias, just to have an increased vocabulary, just to have the question, really. I mean, if we break it down right now, this this awareness that's growing is, is bringing questions. And that is, that, is, that is where the solution will come from. And uh, so I just think that, you know, everybody, everybody has power in this situation, no matter where you are, no matter what your role is, you can be making a difference with what you have, where you are. And if you're so inclined to, that you want, if you want to help push science, then yes, absolutely. You know, AmericanBrainFoundation.org slash LBD, you know, that's where our research grant program is. That's our Louis Body Dementia Fund. Um, I'm sure, Melissa, you know of a lot of great things as well. And, and I think, in fact, you just got a pretty good research grant, which... I right? did, and it, and it really kind of speaks to your point about how people living with this disease can drive the questions. Yes. So, I mean, when we think about Lewy body dementia research, we need everything. So we need research in the lab about what is happening in the brain and why is it happening? We need this research about biomarkers. How do we make a diagnosis better and how do we track it? We need drugs, drugs to slow it down and drugs to better treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole lot more that we need to know about what happens when people have this disease. So, you know, one of the powerful experiences from my own experience is when I was earlier in my career, people came to me and said, okay, you made this diagnosis, what's going to happen? How am I, you know, what's, what's my next few years like? And then how am I gonna die? And I was young, I was early in my career, you know, I went to the scientific journals and there was not a single yeah. article, not one, saying how people with dementia with Lewy body die. And so this question that came out of the clinical experience, a very appropriate and common question, made me say, well, I couldn't find this answer. And these are the questions that I like to answer with research. What do people really want to know about what's going to happen? So we started with a survey of people whose loved one had died with DLB. Then we, we did, I did some interviews about what that experience was like. That was all funded by one of my patients, so that made a huge difference. And then we were able to use that as pilot data. And then just in the last month, I got a $3 million grant from the NIA to look more rigorously at this question. What is the disease like, not from the beginning, but once you're already in the midst of it, what is it like in the middle stages? What is it like in the end stages? How do we know when people are going from the middle to the end? And while we wait for the cure, because we all want a cure, but in the meantime, we also have to ask those research questions. Okay, someone's working on the cure, that is really important, but that's not me. But I'm gonna look at how do we make life better now? How do we help people understand what's coming? How do we uh, you know, make sure people have the resources they need? And how do we make the end of life better while we wait for a way to try to stop this? And so it's both humbling and scary and exciting to say, we need research all along that path. But that also is a lot of opportunities. If you wanna sponsor research, whatever your interest is, there's a need. If you wanna participate in research, do you wanna be in something where we just learn from you and your regular visits? Do you wanna try a drug? Do you wanna try a new biomarker scan? There really is something for everyone. That's great. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question. I don't have a question, somebody wrote me a question, which back, which is a fantastic question, actually, and one that I think frustrates us as doctors and researchers, frustrates pa patients, and frustrates caregivers. And that is the lack of coordination amongst the research community. So the question is, is there coordination with the research being done? My brother 
is in a study at the Cleveland Clinic funded by NIH. I hope his research can add to your study. Mm -hmm. So now both of you have, you're a researcher, Dr. Armstrong, and Susan, you've advocated at the NIH and across government agencies for more research funding into this. So talk to us about the level of coordination or the lack thereof amongst this research community. Uh, I'll go first and then I'm looking forward to hearing what Melissa says. <laughs> um, I, I would say that, that great question, great question. And part of why I've enjoyed so much being on the board at the American Brain Foundation for the last five years is because our board is made up um, half neurologists and half public members. And I've gotten to learn a lot about the world of science and research and how it works because that was my, my concern was, well, what's the point of pouring in money here? If you know, who is coordinating all this, let's get, let's solve this stuff. Let's not just be in this be, to be in it. Let's solve, how are we going to solve these things? So what I learned was, um, in fact, well, just from the people I've met who are at different aspects within the research world, you know, there's heads of labs, there's Walter Korschitz, head of the um, National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke. Walter is actually in the film. And Walter, people like in Walter's position, like um, the scientists who designed our research grant around the world, um, Melissa, there are people who are in strategic positions that they eat this, they eat science for breakfast. They eat these long, I mean, sometimes you guys send me these papers that little nighttime reading, Susan, you know, and it's like, oh my God, they eat this stuff for breakfast. And so they know, they have their finger on the pulse of what's going on. And, and here's a point that I particularly like about our research project, the Lewy Body Dementia Project, because we have specialists from different organizations. So, um, gosh, I, I wish, uh, so it's not just the American Brain Foundation. We have, I think there's someone from Alzheimer's Association on it. And um, they're basically in many different key points and they've come together, they've stepped outside of their siloed organization to come together and create something that they know is needed and they know the way in which it's needed because they have their eyes on the science going on in their organization as and so so this different kind of like uh um galactic council approach to science is very powerful and i think we're moving more in that direction and uh i'll tee it up to you melissa <laughs> I would say I think we're doing a pretty good job of this now on the research level. Uh, so in 2017, the Lewy Body Dementia Association established a Lewy Body De Dementia Research Center of Excellence program. And it recognizes both research and clinical excellence. And it's a network originally of 25. I think now they might have 26 or 27 centers in the US where there is a specialty focus on Lewy body dementia. And the goal of this program was twofold. One, recognizing a center where people could go and know they will get high quality Lewy body dementia care. But then two, it was to create a network of sites where we could be doing clinical research trials. And that Cleveland Clinic uh, trial that you mentioned, it's sponsored by the NIH. And the sites for that trial are some of these center of excellence sites. So these sites, um, we collaborate on research for my recently funded study. It'll involve five of these centers of excellence. And so I do think it really, we have complementary interests. You know, we talked about that whole spectrum we need. Different researchers at different sites are, are tackling different elements of this. But I think we're pretty well connected. And then we're also well connected with some of the researchers doing this in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And right now, every two to three years, we're coming together for a international Lewy body dementia conference. There was one last year, Susan was there. Um, and so that really brings all the Lewy body researchers together. 
Where I think we really need to improve is in clinical care, because what we don't want is the clinical care to remain in these 25 silos. It will be terrible for Lewy body care if you can only get Lewy body care at one of 25 places in the US. And so I think one of our great challenges that kind of uh, spans clinic and research is how do we make sure that you don't have to see me to get Lewy body dementia care that is excellent? How do you get that care if you're in rural Florida, if you're in a state without a center of excellence? We know that a lot of people not only aren't getting diagnosed, but even if they have the diagnosis, their doctors aren't sure what to do. So I think we need to find a way to take what we have in these silos, which might be okay for connecting researchers, but for clinical care, we need to find a way to spread that. How does that happen, Dr. Armstrong? That is a great question. And I don't think we know. <laughs> and, and the honest truth is, I think it's gonna have to happen in more than one way. Uh, so there's gonna be no one easy answer to how do we educate people about Lewy body? How do we help people recognize it? How do we give doctors the tools? There's so many things doctors need to take care of now. Um, and so I don't think there's any one easy answer, but I do think um, it starts by helping people recognize it in themselves or their loved ones. It helps by he having general physicians, primary care physicians, general neurologists learn more about, or, or at least enough to say, huh, you know, I heard, I saw that movie, this sounds kind of like it. Let me pull up the symptom checklist and see if this might match. Um, and then enough to also say, okay, I haven't seen a lot of this before, but let me find a place where I can read about care that I can give to this person. But I think there are gonna to have to be lots of different strategies, and I think we need to be creative and find some new ones too. I, I would guess because Lewy body is in the dementia zone, and you've got the neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, that there's, you know, these, Dementia in general and Alzheimer's Parkinson is already pushed out through clinical care. So it's almost like the neuron pathways are already there. We just, you know, this can be something that flows into it, the um, intelligence about Lewy body. And again, by whether it's the patients and caregivers in the office asking the question, or now maybe the um, general neurologist being more informed about it and realizing, oh, one of the choices here, it could be Lewy body because that is, because people are waking up to realizing that's a thing. And it's, it's right in there with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's something to ask about. So yeah. <clears throat> maybe that could help out. Yeah, yeah. You see, there's a you know, question there's a about telemedicine and I'll say that there's potential, but uh, we need to figure out how to do it well. So there are a couple of limitations to telemedicine. One is it's still within states. So you can only give telemedicine in the states with your license. It's a little more complicated than that. But the, I think the take home is telemedicine uh, coverage is complicated um, and may or may not last beyond COVID. But I will say as someone who works with people with LBD and their caregivers, tell us that medicine has been a very mixed experience. Um, it can be hard to use for some of the populations living with this disease. Uh, it is a disease where people can have delusions. Um, and sometimes, you know, people, one of the delusions people have is that the screen is talking to me. And then all of a sudden the screen is actually talking to them uh, through telemedicine. And that's caused complications for some people. Um, kind of it gets all wrapped up in the delusion that's part of the LBD. Making that LBD diagnosis involves looking for Parkinson features, and some of that is something I have to touch, I have to feel. Um, and I find it really hard, especially for brand new patients, to really get that connection through telemedicine. And then we also don't have great ways to do therapy through telemedicine yet. So I think the telemedicine question is there is potential there. That is a way that we can potentially reach people in rural communities, people who can't access these specialty centers, but it's really complicated and we're gonna have to figure out how to do it well. Yeah, thank you. There's a, <clears throat> a question here, uh, just, 
I have to say this, but when I was in training, there was a place to go when one wanted to know everything one needed to know about movement disorders. You know what I'm going to say, right? Um, and one would go to Aspen because you remember the course that went on in Aspen. And I remember neurologists from all over the country would flock to Aspen for a weekend and learn everything, get an update that would, that would satisfy them for at least a year, if not longer. And sometimes a nationally or internationally recognized symposium that provides a concise, direct educational experience for neurologists and for primary care doctors, one-stop shopping. And now we can do it virtually. So it can be a hybrid uh, sort of opportunity. But I think, I think that's something that we should be thinking about for Lewy body disease, for all movement disorders, and for other disciplines in neurology as well. There used to be that type of program. There isn't anymore. Um, there's a comment here about an updated practice parameter would be a good starting point. There are good ones for diagnosis, but with newer Parkinson-tolerated antipsychotics now coming out, maybe another update. And, you know, tell me what you think about that, uh, Dr. Armstrong, but I'll say that these practice parameters take a long time to develop. <laughs> and there's so much scrutiny and rigor around them that it's, uh, if I wanted to lead a, a group to develop a practice parameter right now, you know how long that would take. So somehow we have to be more nimble, more flexible, and get information out there that's timely uh, and important to an audience, to the general public, and, and to primary care doctors and neurologists. So to the question about guidelines, so I have worked on the AAN's evidence-based guideline program for years. Um, and it is a really valuable and important program, but it doesn't meet the needs of every disease. It really is very firmly based in the scientific evidence, which is important. Uh, but for better or worse, Lewy body care right now is still somewhat an art form. It's based on our experiences, what we've learned. Not everything is covered in a research trial. And so I don't think that AAN's process, while I've been a big part of it and it's hugely important, I don't think it fits the Lewy body need very well right now. There is a group out of the UK that had funding to develop some uh, approaches to DLB diagnosis and management, and they have published those now. Um, and we have looked at them from the US perspective, and the vast majority of their recommendations could be easily translated to the US system. We have generally similar care uh, on both sides of the pond, as they say. Um, so I think those are the most up-to-date. There have been some discussions about whether we want to formally convert those to a U.S. context, but even that would take a, a fair amount. But I do think having a resource um, for providers to go to if they say, maybe this is Louis body, where should I go, uh, would be a valuable tool. Yeah. And I think we'll end with this one. And Susan, I'm, I'm sure that you get caregivers who come to you uh, now and ask you questions and ask you what should they do. And there's a question here, what is key to being a caregiver, particularly in late stages? And so what do you tell family members who come to you looking for help, asking your advice on what, what they should do and what they shouldn't do? Boy, the first thing that comes to mind is, is having a team. And what I want to say is, I, I think this is uh, our, we had, we had, boy, we had <clears throat> two psychiatrists, a hypnotherapist, um, a motor specialist, neurologist, general physician. We had a lot of doctors. Um, and the problem was nobody knew what they were looking at. They weren't connecting the dots. So I think having people that are your team, your medical team, your clinicians, sorry, I need a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> having them coordinated and working as a team, working as a team is everything. And then I think as a caregiver, 
my experience was that no one believed me, you know, or they, they, they minimalized what I was saying about our experience. It was, it literally felt like my husband was drowning in quicksand and there was nothing I could do. And that was, you know, if our, the, this is the, why the first thing I think of is if, if our team was, was actually connected and knew that it was Louis body we're, we were dealing with, there think, I think that the treatment would have been different. You know, we would have gotten there faster. Um, I, I, you know, unfortunately I can't really, I can't really talk about cl clinician care or um, treatments. You know, we didn't have a, we didn't have an opportunity of getting there. We didn't get there. Um, so I, so just, I think to, to help the caregiver in that position, which is, is one of the most, most difficult positions to be in. You know, all these diseases are incredibly tough for caregivers and, and Louis body has its own special um, place with that. It's very challenging. So, uh, you know, make sure that you are talking about it, you're asking questions and that um, there's a great community too. You know, um, lvda.org, I would reach out to them um, because you know, while we are at the American Brain Foundation, we're all about connecting donors to research and science, and we want to push the science forward. LVDA is is great with um, helping caregivers and patients and families um, understand what's going on. So that's what I would recommend: is go to lvda.org. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Yeah. And there was a comment here: awareness, awareness, awareness. And um, you, more than anybody, Susan, have definitely. Um, you and Robin through this film have definitely raised awareness and you'll continue to do so throughout the world. There's no doubt about that. So thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're going to continue to do. Um, and Dr. Armstrong, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, it was a terrific conversation. Tonight it was totally unscripted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I asked questions you didn't know were coming. So um, Those so were not on the list. <laughs> no, they were not on the list, but uh, you did a fantastic job, and thanks so much for being here, and, and good luck with all of, all of the work that uh, you're, you're about to embark upon, and congratulations on your award. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for uh, being a part of the foundation, for contributing to the foundation, um, mm -hmm. and for coming this evening and giving us some of your time. Thanks, everyone, and stay well, and be healthy, and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.